just in case you're confused, I'm Richard Blundell, uh, not Richard Smith. I've been asked to chair this session, and I'm uh, delighted to introduce uh, Charles Mansky to uh, give the uh, 2013 Sargon Lecture. Uh, this is a lecture to the honor the memory of Dennis Sargon and the influence he'd, he had over many of us. And I can't think of a better person to uh, give this lecture than uh, Charles Mansky. Chuck Mansky is the Board of Trustees Professor at Northwestern University. He's a fellow of the Econometric Society, American Academy of Arts and Science, National Academy of Sciences, and many more. I should add, he's international fellow of CMAP, uh, and a regular visitor to these shores. Uh, to those of you who've uh, read Chuck's work over the years, you will, have, have, as I have learned, to listen with attention to what he says. Chuck has an uncanny ability to be ahead of the game in econometrics and applied economics thinking. Just think back to his uh, 1975, that's a long time ago, paper on maximum score. Uh, little did we realize that that would herald the development of semi-parametrics in econometrics. And you can go through many of his other contributions. His work on choice-based sampling, partial identification and the estimation of bounds, measurement of expectations, and uh, more recently, choice under ambiguity. And we're going to hear more about that in this lecture. So let me hand the stage to Charles Mansky to give the Sargon Lecture. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Richard. Um, if, I, I have an unfair advantage over all the other sessions, except for Richard's tomorrow and uh, uh, Matt Jackson's and Raquel's. That you have, there's no competition right now, so uh, you get a, a, you get a larger audience than the econometrics talk uh, typically would get. Um, but I, I hope I'm going to have something to say that will be of uh, interest beyond. Uh, uh, econometrics. Actually, uh, this work is at the intersection of uh, three literatures. If you look at the uh, title I've chosen, uh, partial identification is certainly an econometrics term, and I'm going to uh, uh, explain that for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Uh, policy choice is a, a normative, is a public economics term, and I'm going to be talking about normative public economics. Ambiguity is a, a term from decision theory and I'm going to be uh, talking about applications of uh, decision theory. And uh, what I want to do is um, explain how I got to this intersection of uh, three uh, seemingly uh, different fields and um, go through a little history of that and uh, then give some uh, illustrative uh, case studies of the work that I've been doing. These will be very uh, particular applications. Obviously, with the time available, I'm... Um, I can only sort of sketch things out, and so I've decided uh, intentionally to keep this entirely uh, non-technical, but there are, there, are, there are real papers with propositions and proofs and so on uh, underneath everything that I, uh, I'm going to talk about. Um, to begin, I think this is the Sargon lecture, and um, I, I never actually uh, met Dennis Sargon, at least, uh, to the best of my recollection. Uh, I was thinking about um, how econometrics has evolved, since his time. When Sagan was uh, working in econometrics, the term identification was associated mainly with uh, systems of simultaneous equations, uh, particularly linear simultaneous equations, but, uh, cert, uh, but uh, occasionally uh, nonlinear. Um, and I was growing up through that period. Uh, I was in you know, graduate school in the uh, early 70s. Uh, although I did not know Sargon, my, my own thesis advisor was uh, Frank Fisher at MIT, who was someone also of that uh, generation. And uh, Frank had written a, uh, a book in 1966, which maybe a few of you uh, know of. It was called The Identification Problem in Econometrics. And, uh, what uh, Frank Fisher wrote in the uh, beginning of that book is as follows. 
because the simultaneous equation context is by far the most important one in which the identification problem is encountered, the treatment is restricted to that context. So although we called it the identification problem, the book was entirely about identification of simultaneous equations and no other identification problems. That, and that was an appropriate term for when he was doing his work and when Dennis uh, Sagan was doing uh, his work. Um, it was also the case when they were active that when people thought of identification, they thought of it as a binary event. A parameter was either identified or not identified. And the presumption was that uh, if it wasn't identified, you really couldn't learn anything uh, useful about it. Um, oops. Well, that's not good. Uh, that's bizarre. Let me. Uh, Go to a backup and see what happens. No? No? Well, let me try from the beginning. What is going on? Uh, this is not good. Um, <laughs> uh, let me try it this way. And me. Yeah, no? Uh oh. That's. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I, uh, uh, this is a, um, what do I need? Um, uh, I, I have it online in two different, I have backups, but it's going to take a while. The, the crazy thing is that I went through this, it says 47, there, you see it's there. You see it's actually, it proves to you I'm not that much of an idiot. Uh, <laughs> Because the, the other, uh, no, the other, um, the slides are on there. And it's just that when I, uh, somehow when I, they didn't show. So let me go back to full screen and see. Oh, okay, this proved. <laughs> you seated me here, didn't this you? Is, uh, this is, proved this is a uh, Royal Holloway glitch. And, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. But I, I, I never trust myself. So I, I have uh, like multiple copies online in various places. <laughs> so let me uh, try again. Um, so identification was a binary event, and uh, parameters are either identified or not. Today, econometricians study uh, many identifying identification problems. Simultaneity remains an important identification problem, but it's no, no longer uh, preeminent as it was. And so that's a, that's a big change from the 1960s and 70s. A, uh, another big change is we now think of identification as a set concept rather than as a uh, point concept. So uh, to use terminology that is familiar for, for the economy, some econometricians in the room, but may not be uh, for all of you, uh, today we, we think of the um, identification region or uh, equivalently the identified set of a parameter, which is if I have given data and if I have given assumptions, what can I learn? It may not be that I can pin down the thing fully, but I may be able to constrain it to a set. And so that's the identification region of the identified set. So this is the literature on partial identification. Um, and a parameter is partially identified if the uh, set that you can constrain it to is anything smaller than the full parameter space. So um, I've studied uh, partial identification um, quite extensively. And uh, one of the first topics that I um, studied beginning in 1990 was identification of treatment response. I'm trying to explain how I got to public economics and applied decision theory. So uh, for those of you who um, uh, know the, uh, uh, the well, analysis of treatment response has become a very common uh, phrase among uh, applied economists. And uh, you know, older phrases might have been a policy evaluation or uh, analysis of program impacts. Or even back when I was in uh, school, we called it comparative statics. That was the term uh, used way back then. And uh, a fundamental identification problem arises from the unobservability of counterfactual outcomes. Uh, and I think everyone's uh, aware of this. One may observe the outcomes of treatments the members of a study population actually receive, but the outcomes of other potential out treatments are um, logically unobservable. And what analysis of treatment response does is it combines data on the outcomes of realized treatments with assumptions to predict counterfactual treatment response. Well, this is what policy analysis is all about. We can observe people's behavior under an existing or status quo policy. We want to predict behavior under some counterfactual uh, policy. So what I did um, 
uh, now over 20 years, I've been studying identification combining with uh, sort of uh, data that are realistically available with uh, assumptions that one might think to be credible. And uh, a, a typical finding for me is that the population distribution of treatment response is partially rather than a point identified. Now, this immediately leads to the problem for um, normative policy analysis for public economics. If you imagine a social planner that is choosing between two treatments, A and B, and uh, a simple case that we often discuss is you could assign everyone to treatment A or everyone to treatment B, and uh, the problem is that um, uh, you don't know which, is, that given the uh, data that's available and the assumptions you're willing to make, the, you don't know which is better. Uh, in, in terms of the, uh, uh, much of the literature, that uh, problem will get encapsulated by a population average treatment effect, and then formally the question is that you don't know the sign of the average treatment effect. So you don't know which treatment is better, so what are you going to do? Um, what, um, I pointed this problem out back in the 1990s. Um, uh, some people reacted saying, well, this shows that partial identification analysis isn't very useful because we have to be able to set up optimization problems that we can solve, and if your work is showing us that we can't get very far with weak assumptions, then we should just make stronger assumptions so that we can solve optimization problems that have tr been traditional in economics. I resisted that uh, conclusion. That didn't seem like the, uh, uh, the, the right uh, conclusion to draw. What seemed to me uh, the right conclusion to draw is that the study of partial identification was revealing fundamental uncertainties in decision making and that we need to face up to those uncertainties. So uh, in terms of the work in partial identification of treatment response, there's a whole set of uh, articles that I've referenced here at the bottom and there, there are many others uh, as well. Now, so that goes through the 1990s. Um, in 2000, what, what for me was a, made for a real sh shift in my research was that I, uh, for the first time, formally expanded my uh, thinking from the study of identification per se to the study of planning when policy outcomes are partially identified. And um, since then, basically over the past 12, 13 years, my research has moved. A lot of the stuff that I do recently is, is, not, is no longer in econometrics. It's, it's really in this intersection of econometrics with uh, normative public economics and decision uh, theory. And what I want to do is to use the uh, time I have to give a status report by uh, describing a set of illustrative case studies. And, and I, I think all economists should be interested in this, but I have uh, two particular audiences most in mind for whom I think uh, there, there are important implications for their own research. One is for the econometr econometricians. This is the Sagan lecture and, and that's you know, usually been an econometrician who's given it. And I hope to persuade econometricians that there's enormous scope for contributions of identification analysis to normative public economics. Um, just if, if I might, um, a pet peeve of mine is that econometric theory has become uh, somewhat uh, too inward looking for my tastes. And uh, articles that get published in the main journals are often readable uh, only by other econometric theorists and uh, not um, connected to economics in the way that they, uh, I think they should be. And uh, I see a uh, huge uh, scope for econometricians. Uh, and I'm going to focus on identification. There's also scope for econometricians who focus on uh, issues of statistical uh, imprecision um, to do more to uh, contribute to uh, applied economics and, and particularly to uh, normative analysis of decision making. So, so that's one uh, you know, audience who I, that I particularly have in mind. The other, from the other, from the other side, are the public economists. The people in public economics have really not paid attention as far as to the extent that they should, uh, uh, as far as I can see, two problems of uh, identification, and uh, particularly as it affects uh, uh, policy planning. And uh, I would like to persuade public e economists to pay more attention to what uh, economists who study identification uh, have been doing for a long time. So those are the two audiences I particularly have in mind. For those of you who have an applied orientation to uh, private decision making by consumers or firms, the same issues show up. And uh, 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 whether we're talking about decisions by firms who have limited information, 
due to identification problems or decision making by uh, individual agents who have limited uh, 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 knowledge as well. The same issues show up. And I could do illustrative case studies of, on those topics as well, uh, except that those have not been uh, the focus of my own attention. Let me say a, uh, a bit about planning under ambiguity, um, just to uh, get everyone to the same place. So when studying collective decision problems, economists have long asked how a, a planner uh, should ask, uh, should act. And a, a standard exercise specifies a set of uh, feasible policies and a welfare function. And the planner is presumed to know the welfare achieved uh, by each policy. The objective is then to characterize the optimal policy. Uh, I, for a long time, uh, ha and it's particularly appropriate to say this here, but I've, for a long time I've been using the um, early study of optimal income taxation as a uh, kind of a leading case of this. I think it's ex you know, extraordinarily well done and, it's, it's, and, it's, you know, and it, uh, obviously you know, recognized for that. Um, but what Merleys did is he, he didn't assume full knowledge on behalf of the, uh, that the planner has full knowledge. There was a, a distribution of skill. There was individual skills that were unknown. But he did assume, if you know, remember the Merleys work, that, he, uh, the people, that the planner knew the distribution of skills in the population and that the planner knew the uh, preferences, the utility functions of people. So there was an optimal planning problem that the uh, planner could uh, solve. Um, the problem in practice, as I see it, though, is that planners often have only partial knowledge of the welfare achieved by alternative policies, and hence they may not be able to determine optimal policies. And so the basic question that I want to talk about is how can you think about doing normative public economics in terms of social planning if you can't solve the optimization problems that we uh, have typically uh, laid out? Now, uh, this is where, where decision theory comes in, and I'm talking about the most elementary concepts of decision theory. Uh, I'm not talking about highly mathematical, abstract, uh, axiomatic decision theory, just kind of very simple ideas in decision theory. There's a, there's a two-step choice process uh, that I, I think is uh, you know, universally uh, um, accepted in, by decision theorists. First step is to eliminate dominated policies. And what this means simply is that even if you have partial knowledge, you may know enough to throw out some policies as being bad, that no matter what the true state of nature is, policy A is worse than policy B, then there's no point in uh, thinking about policy A, even if you don't know for sure uh, uh, everything about the world. Uh, the hard part of decision analysis, though, is what do you do among, for choice among undominated policies? And, what, and, and, and my own perspective on this, and I think the perspective of um, uh, lots of dis people who work in decision theory, is there is no uniquely optimal way to choose among undominated alternatives. There are only various reasonable ways. The reason I'm, I, I have to give a caveat, because there's a subset of decision theorists following the um, you know, extremely important work of Leonard Savage in the 1950s, who think there is one optimal, rational way to make decisions with uh, partial information, and that's to maximize expected utility. And that's coming from Savage's axiomatic framework. And, that, and, and Savage thought that. If you go back and read Savage, he thought that anyone who wasn't obeying his axioms is not rational. You know, that's the way, that, that was the, uh, the rhetoric of uh, Savage uh, next to the math in his uh, book. Uh, but I think the, the, uh, uh, that view, I think, has lost ground in the past 30 years. And there's now all kinds of ideas floating around decision uh, theory about uh, different reasonable ways to uh, handle partial information. Uh, one of them, of course, is to assert a subjective distribution on unknowns and maximize subjective expected welfare. Uh, I think that's fine. Uh, in those cases where it, uh, a person can credibly assert a subjective distribution. And in fact, I, I could hardly say that I'm against that idea because Richard mentioned very briefly that uh, one line of my own research is uh, empirical work eliciting subjective probability distributions. This is the work on measuring expectations. So I take seriously the idea that people in their heads really, you know, on uh, many uh, issues that are close to their own lives, uh, actually um, have well-defined subjective probability distributions and use them in decision making. So I'm certainly not against that. It's just that um, it doesn't come free, and I think and there are a lot of situations where uh, you don't have a credible uh, basis for a subjective probability distribution. And, and, and this is where the identification problems come in, 
the, uh, often when you're doing partial identification analysis, you, you get a result that some parameter of interest lies in some set. And then if you ask, well, what can I say anything more than that other than it lies on that set? Well, then someone could say, well, put a subjective probability distribution on the set. Well, where's it going to come from? And then people have difficulty. So uh, I got attracted to the uh, literature on decision making under ambiguity. The term ambiguity coming from Ellsberg in 1961. For people here who have a macro background, just substitute the word nighty and uncertainty for ambiguity. It means the same thing. Um, considering planning under ambiguity, I've uh, focused attention on two uh, kind of very long-standing uh, decision concepts that don't use subjective probability distributions. One is maximin, which I think everyone is uh, familiar with uh, doing a kind of worst case analysis and choosing the least bad worst case. The other is minimax regret, which is often confused with maximin, and I'll talk a bit more about that uh, if you're not familiar with it. And so I list a, a whole series of um, uh, technical articles there, and then I have to have uh, one point where I can make a plug for my uh, brand new book, uh, the non-technical exposition on uh, public policy in an uncertain world, which was published just a month or two ago. This, this was aimed at a broader audience than people in this room, an uh, audience of people who are not technical economists. But, and, and so this is a verbal book. It's, it's, an, it's, a, uh, it's entirely a non-mathematical book. Uh, but I still think uh, may be useful to, to some of you. Now, I'm talking about, um, uh, okay, so let me go on one more and then I'll have an, have an aside. Maximum, as I said, evaluates an action by the worst welfare it may yield and chooses uh, 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 an action that yields the least bad worst welfare. For minimax regret, if you're not familiar with that, the regret of an action in the state of nature is the loss in welfare that would occur if one were to choose this action rather than the one that's best in the state of nature. So here, if I have an action C that maximizes welfare in some state S, but if one chooses action D instead, then there's a regret from choosing D, which is uh, WCS minus WDS. Uh, Does this uh, do anything? No. I shouldn't have touched this thing because probably it won't. I'll get a blank screen again if I do that. So I won't, I won't take a chance on it. Uh, so regret is the loss that you suffer relative to doing the optimal thing. The problem is that you don't know what the true state of nature is, so you can't make the optimal choice. And so what minimax regret criterion does is chooses an action that minimizes maximum regret across uh, all states of nature. And uh, I've done a lot of formal analysis of that. Now let me... Um, before I go on to the next, I want to have an aside here. I'm talking about, I don't have a slide on this, but I realized that I should have. I'm going to be talking about social planning. So there's going to be a benevolent dictator who uh, makes decisions on behalf of society. Of course, if you're interested in real public policy making in a, a democracy, you should be thinking about social choice problems, about political games and uh, all, all of that. And uh, those problems are, uh, the, the issues of incomplete information will obviously show up there as well as in any social planning context. So if we have a parliamentary decision for decision making, then the parliament will have partial information about policy impacts. Or if it's a bilateral negotiation between unions and management, they, they may have partial information about policy impacts. So um, uh, social choice settings um, will, have, uh, will face all of the uh, uh, difficulties of partial information that are concerned with me, but on top of them, they'll have the um, uh, very hard problems of analyzing uh, social choice. So I've done a little bit of that. So I'll just mention, I have a couple of uh, just uh, short recent papers. One that talks about uh, um, uh, majority rule voting and uh, sort of ex uses the median voter idea in a context where all voters have limited information and voters themselves apply the minimax regret rule to decide what their ideal points are. Just to mention to you if you're interested in that. Then, and then I also done a little bit of work on bilateral negotiation. Uh, it's kind of a two-person game with minimax regret. And uh, so uh, I won't say anything further about that, but that's a, uh, a wide open, I think, area for application. The other one that I do want to say a word about is that uh, econometrics gets associated uh, heavily with uh, statistics, with inference from samples to populations. I'm not going to be focusing on that at all, but obviously the uh, problem of statistical induction from samples to population is uh, critical um, uh, as well. That's not the orientation of the current econometric theory literature. The current econometric theory literature is very, very heavily focused on local asymptotic theory uh, for purposes of doing... Uh, uh, parameter estimation and uh, hypothesis testing. Uh, 
And uh, the idea of actually using econometrics as an input to decision making, in my view, very unfortunately has gone out of the literature. Um, there was, and you got to sort of be of a certain age to remember when it was in the literature. It was actually in the literature even before my generation, but I'm old enough to remember that I heard about this and I've come back to it. So if you go back, uh, I mentioned the Wald framework. So, so this is you know, an absolutely beautiful piece of work by Abraham Wald called Statistical Decision Functions, a short book published in 1950, which um, Wald had begun working on this in the late 1930s and published in the journals in the 30s and 40s, but then he put it together in this little book in uh, 1950. And, and this was the foundations of a frequent statistical decision theory, uh, which could also embrace Bayesian statistical decision theory. It, it's very interesting to me, I think disheartening. When Wald's work, book came out in 1950, there was an explosion of work on statistical decision theory, partly by statisticians publishing in places like the Annals of Mathematical Statistics and Journal of the American Statistical Association and Biometrica and so on, uh, and partly by economists, econometricians. There were, you could find papers routinely in econometrica in the 1950s that were working in the Wald uh, framework. By the time I got to graduate school, that had stopped. Okay, I sort of learned about it a bit because I happened to take a course from Ed Lemer when I was a uh, graduate student and he was teaching it. Otherwise, I, I don't think I ever would have learned about it. And, and hardly anyone teaches it these days. I think that's a big mistake. Uh, I've begun teaching it again. I've done work on it. Uh, so I have an econometric article in 2004 and I've listed a few others uh, here as well. But, but these are still mostly technical papers. They have not gotten to the area of application that I want to discuss today. Okay. But, but I, I think this has been, a, um, for the econometricians in the room, I think uh, this is a, uh, a very important direction for further uh, work in econometric theory. Okay, now I want to take, so that's the background. What I want to take the rest of the time for is to the uh, extent that uh, time permits, go through a um, um, kind of sketch out a series of uh, papers that I've uh, written and published and try to at least give you the gist of them and I, and, uh, without unfortunately having the time to go into any of them in, in uh, detail. And uh, if we run out of time, I just won't do all of them. But, but let's see as far as I can get. So um, diversify treatment under ambiguity. Okay, uh, It's an International Economic Review in 2009. So these, everything I'm talking about now is fairly recent work done uh, since the mid-2000s. So some of it's just working papers. Um, Many planning problems share uh, a, a quite a simple structure that I mentioned earlier that there's uh, two treatments, treatment A and B, and the planner has to uh, ch uh, choose a treatment for each member of the population. And, and this is a kind of a micro planning problem rather than a macro planning problem in the sense that you could make a different treatment decision for each person. I could assign a, a treatment A to tr or treatment B to every person in this room. And that's a, these could be health treatments or educational treatments or uh, active labor market treatments, whatever they might be. And, and we'll assume that treatment is individualistic or there's non, uh, in David Cox's terms, there's no interference between units or Rubin's terms, uh, sattva. Um, so uh, that simplifies the problem as well. And then the problem is, and, and the welfare pro function that you want to maximize is very simple. We're going to add up the outcomes of population members and uh, maybe take a monotone transformation of the outcomes if we want. But basically we want to uh, maximize the mean outcome in the population. So this goes back to early utilitarian uh, social welfare functions, uh, some other additive or welfare function. Well, the optimal policy in a uh, situation like that's very simple, is to assign all persons to the treatment that yields the higher mean outcome, okay? Um, where ambiguity comes in is if the planner does not know which treatment has the higher mean outcome. So earlier I talked about partial identification. Well, this is uh, exactly the result, is that if you don't have enough information to get the sign of the average treatment effect, then you don't know whether, in terms of this welfare function, treatment A is better or worse than treatment B. And then the question is, well, what are you going to do? Um, so that's a, uh, that, that's a very, very common problem. Uh, here's a simple example of, on uh, medical treatment, uh, but uh, it's very easy to describe. Let, let me uh, give another example that you might not think about because of the one time in this talk I'll talk about a uh, private decision-making problem rather than a public policy is an investor's asset allocation decision. Uh, I mentioned treatment A and treatment B, and I, I thought about a social planner assigning uh, members of a population 
to treatment A and treatment B. If I just change the language from a planner to an investor, then an investor is a social planner. And, um, the pop and the investor is choosing treatments for a population. Now, it's not a population of um, human beings. It's a population of currency units, of dollars or pounds or euros. And the investor can uh, assign some uh, pounds, just in some here, to, uh, to, let's say, to stocks, and the other to bonds. Treatment A and treatment B can be stocks and bonds. Uh, one could be a safe asset and one's a risky asset. Uh, welfare in that context is the aggregate return earned by the investor. And, well, uh, a, a very uh, you know, basic problem in finance is making investment decisions with partial knowledge. Right? Now, in the finance literature, um, how the, uh, the routine way of dealing with partial knowledge is to assume that the investor places a subjective probability distribution on the returns to the two assets and uh, maximizes subjective expected utility. Okay? Um, and the question comes up, what would the investor do with ambiguity? How might an investor make decisions if he didn't have a subjective probability distribution on the two assets? That has the same, exactly the same mathematical structure as the uh, social planner choosing between the two treatments. The reason I'm raising this uh, 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 discussion of uh, financial dif uh, of uh, finance is that a, uh, uh, an idea in finance that everyone's familiar with is diversification. Uh, we talk about a, por a diversified portfolio if an investor allocates positive fractions of wealth to different investments. Well, the very first thing to keep in mind is that the rationale for diversification is exactly incompleteness of knowledge. An investor who knew returns to investments would never diversify. They would just put all of the uh, endowment in the uh, investment with a higher return. The whole uh, reason for being of diversification is to deal with partial knowledge. Uh, what diversification enables an investor to do is to balance potential errors between uh, the two uh, assets. The idea that I uh, uh, propose in this uh, paper I wrote in 2009 is to uh, think about uh, diversification of treatments to a human population rather than diversification of uh, assets uh, in the investment problem. And I say that the treatment choice is diversified if a planner allocates positive fractions of the population to each treatment. And diversification enables a planner who is uncertain about treatment response to balance potential errors, which is maybe treatment B is error better, but you assign people to treatment A or vice versa. So those are the different errors that you can make. Important point uh, is that treatment diversification differs from profiling because diversification calls for randomly differential treatment of people, whereas profiling is uh, conditioning on observed attributes of people. And you may want to do both. Okay? So, but diversification is what you do among people who are observationally identical. Question is, technical question in the paper is, well, what decision criteria yield diversification? And so here's the, uh, I'm not going to go through the math, but just the uh, results. We, we know we can get diversification from the expected utility framework by imposing a monotone transformation on profits or the additive welfare and uh, making it concave so that the investor or the planner then would be risk averse, as the term we use, and then having a sufficient spread in the subject of distribution. Then you can get diversification out of that. You can ask, well, what if there's ambiguity? Well, it turns out from the mac if you apply the maximum criteria, you may diversify in some settings, but only in some particular settings. In a very large fraction of, uh, of cases, uh, if you apply the maximum criteria, you won't diversify. Basically, if you want to choose between a safe asset and a risky asset, or one treatment that's the status quo, where you know the, re uh, the outcomes, and another is an innovation, and you don't know the outcomes, if you apply maximum, you're going to be ultra conservative and put everybody into the status quo. On the other hand, if you look at this from minimax regret criterion, you get a ex very, very different result. The minimax regret criterion with two treatments always diversifies. And that's what's proved in this uh, 2009 paper. And then I do various extensions of that. And I've gone on record since then of actually uh, suggesting uh, diversification as a strategy for making uh, policy choices. And, and I, I could talk about this for hours, but obviously don't have the time to do that. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Let me talk for a few minutes about a brand new paper, but also about treatments. Uh, this is about, you know, the, the language of treatment response comes from medicine. And I've become interested in medical decision making. Uh, clinicians, 
so, th so this is uh, of practical interest to everybody in the room. Whatever field of economics you're in is we're all medical patients at some point. And we uh, may go to a physician's office with some kind of problem, and a physician is going to uh, make a, is the, is going to act as a social planner, basically, acting hopefully on our behalf in making a treatment decision. And uh, physicians have partial information. You know, medical research uh, may be very extensive, but we still only have partial knowledge of treatment response uh, in medicine, and uh, that's the way it is. Um, I looked at the literature in medical research on uh, providing um, help to practicing clinicians for making uh, decisions. Let's think about a you know, s serious medical problem, uh, possibility of a cancer diagnosis or a, um, you know, heart disease or something like that. And uh, some of you may be aware of, some of you are not, there are things called clinical practice guidelines. Uh, and what clinical practice, this is a, um, I have a quote here from a 2011 report of the Institute of Medicine in the United States. Institute of Medicine is part of the National Academy of Sciences uh, complex. Uh, the, the report is on towards trustworthy clinical practice guidelines. This is the definition of clinical practice guidelines. They are statements that include recommendations intended to optimize patient care that are informed by a systematic review of evidence and an assessment of the benefits and harms of alternative care options. This is a report written by medical researchers, not by economists, but this language would suggest uh, something very close to normative public economics. They talk about optimization and about doing cost-benefit analysis uh, for getting uh, clinical p practice guidelines. Um, it talks about developing uh, rigorous clinical practice guidelines. Unfortunately, if you read inside the report, there is no explicit optimization, no welfare function, and no explicit optimization problem uh, written down or solved in this report. And this began to worry me as a human being even more so than as an economist. Um, in fact, uh, I was actually quite surprised in a negative way that this, uh, this is about 300 page report that had brought to bear no formal decision analysis at all. You know, nothing akin to what we're familiar with in uh, normative public economics. There was one paragraph in the entire report that discussed decision analysis and stated as follows that a frontier of evidence-based medicine is decision analytic modeling and healthcare alternatives assessment. Uh, goes on, although the field is currently fraught with controversy and they don't explain what the controversy is. The committee acknowledges that it's exciting and potentially promising, however decided the state of the art is not ready for direct comment. <laughs> this is a kind of language I would expect to see from a United Nations uh, <laughs> document, you know, not, but maybe, I don't know what went on in this IOM committee, but that was clearly uh, well-crafted, um, useless diplomatic language. Um, um, it's very surprising to me, though, because the report ignores the fact that the foundations of decision analysis were in place largely uh, you know, in the 1940s and 50s, more than 50 years ago. And it also ignores the fact that even within medicine, there, there's a subfield within medicine that actually does things of the type that normative public economics does. So if you're not familiar with this, there is something called the Society for Medical Decision Making. Uh, it publishes a journal called Medical Decision Making. And if you read that, it's filled with optimization problems that look like normative public economics. Um, so that's troubling. Now, um, so this IOM report, you know, I talk at some length about it. I, I, I found it wanting. Uh, what I did in this new paper is, well, I could have just written um, about uh, treatment decisions, as I was just talking about, treatment A and treatment B. I, I, I became interested in, this is a new technical problem. One was a, uh, is very interesting, I think, is that as a prelude to treatment, uh, physicians will offer order uh, what's called a diagnostic test. So if you have some symptoms and something doesn't look quite right, then uh, they'll order a diagnostic test. It may be a very simple test, like a urine test or a blood test, and which they'll do routinely. It's non-invasive. It's inexpensive. But, uh, you know, but these diagnostic tests uh, may be very expensive and invasive. So I'm talking about uh, hard biopsies. I'm talking about PET scans and CAT scans and, and uh, that kind of thing. And then there's a serious uh, two-step decision process that the clinician has to follow. It's the first, do I order a diagnostic test? And, and that's a decision that has to be made with limited information. Because if you knew everything, there'd be no reason for a test in the first place. And, uh, and then if I, if I don't order the test, then I go ahead and make the treatment decision. And if I do order the test, then I have to um, 
uh, I get the results, I have more information, and then I make a decision after seeing the test result. So I thought that's a quite an interesting, kind of a simplest non-trivial dynamic uh, treatment decision. First testing and then treatment. And I decided to take a formal look at that. Uh, I became particularly interested in a practice that I gave a name. I, ev everyone will recognize it, I think, but I just couldn't find a name for it in the medical literature. I call it aggressive treatment with positive testing. This is the idea that um, uh, uh, th there is some kind of really uh, aggressive treatment that could be performed. If I think about cancer, it could be you know, something systemic like chemotherapy or uh, immunotherapy or something like that, but, but you don't want to do that kind of thing lightly. It has all kinds of bad side effects and so on. And so you have a protocol that says that, well, if I don't do a biopsy, I'm not going to give anyone chemotherapy, right? So if there's no testing, you don't do the uh, aggressive treatment. You do what's called in the medical uh, literature uh, active surveillance, so what used to be called watchful waiting. Just watch someone and hope that something doesn't develop. If you do give a test, then if the test result is positive, which is bad, remember, in medicine, a positive test result is that they find something, then you go for the aggressive treatment, and if the test result is negative, then you just watch the person. So, so that's a very particular kind of um, clinical practice guideline that you do aggressive treatment only if there's a positive result of a test. So I thought, well, let's look at that as a, uh, as a kind of, uh, uh, that's, that's one kind of uh, decision process. And you can think about optimization. Now, it turned out, when I looked at the literature, there was an optimization, uh, there was a literature on optimizing testing and treatment. Uh, paper, it was quite a nice paper in 1990, uh, 1988 by uh, Phelps and Mushlin in this journal, Medical Decision Making. Uh, Chuck Phelps is a health economist. Uh, who's, uh, he's retired, but he's still uh, you know, uh, active. Uh, Mushlin, I, I don't know. And, um, uh, they set this up in a way that any public economist might set the, the problem. They first assume that clinicians have rational expectations. They don't have perfect foresight, but they have rational expectations, so they know the distribution of treatment response, conditioning on whatever information they have, and that they maximize expected uh, utility. And then the usefulness of testing is expressed by what's called in that literature the expected value of information, which is defined by David Meltzer, another person who works in this area, as the change in expected utility with the collection of information. So anyone who has a public economics background would easily recognize what goes on in this paper and maybe you know, will have written papers similarly on different topics. My concern in, in the new paper I did is, well, what if you... Uh, um, if you take that problem, but don't assume as much as they uh, assumed. They assume that the clinician has rational expectations. Assuming that the clinician has rational expectations basically means the clinician has solved the identification problem in, for analysis of treatment response. That's, that's what rational expectations means in this context. And I, you know, based on my own work, find that uh, somewhat implausible. So what I did formally in the paper was ask, well, if I were a clinician and I had partial knowledge of the uh, of uh, response to treatment, and also partial knowledge of how people respond to testing, of what test results would be, and then reset up this problem that Phelps and Michelin set up, and set it up as a uh, problem of decision making under ambiguity, two steps, first test and then treat, then what would come out of that? So I don't have the time, I'm just, just giving you the flavor of it, uh, that's what the paper does. And uh, this is all partial identification analysis. Uh, based on the uh, information that's available. And then I talk about applying maximin and minimax regret as, the, um, as possibilities there. Okay, so that's all the time I have to talk about that. I'll skip over a couple of things. Um, next, I'll just take in the little time I have left, talk very briefly. The very first paper I did on this topic was actually, this is the Royal Economic Society. The very first applied paper I did was published in uh, EJ in the Economic Journal in 2006 on search pro profiling with partial knowledge of deterrence. Um, this is a, uh, a problem of policing. Uh, and the, uh, the social planner is the uh, criminal justice system or the police. And uh, the decision is how actively to search for evidence of crime. So you can think about this as searching for uh, you know, drug testing, searching for evidence of drug taking, or airport screening. And, and the question is, what search rate to use? Uh, there is a literature in, in the economics of law and crime setting this up as a classical normative public economics problem, where you um, choose an optimal search rate. Okay? If you go, there's an article 
nice is a review article in the Journal of Economic Literature by Chevelle and Polinsky back in 2000, which sets up a whole set of optimization problems of that type. And, and this is in the Murley's tradition. And what those problems set up, it, it, they assume that the planner knows a lot. In particular, they assume, assume that the planner knows the deterrent effect of police action. So if I increase the search rate, that may dissuade people from committing crimes. But the question for me is, how would we know that? What is the deterrent effect? If you read the criminology literature, then you, bec you realize very quickly that we don't know much about the deterrent effect of crime. The only assumption that one might um, uh, make that I, I think would have universal acceptance, or almost universal acceptance, is that if I increase the search rate, the crime rate will go down that there's a monotonicity relationship. That you know, if you have a higher rate, higher chance of being caught, there's going to be less crime. And you have just that monotonicity and nothing else. So that, that's what I assume, is that the uh, criminal justice system, the police, only know, they, they know they have an existing, what I assume is they have some data. So this is what makes it an econometric problem. They know what happened under a status quo search policy. And then they're willing to make one assumption that if they increase the search rate relative to the status quo, then crime rate will go down. If they decrease it, the crime rate will go up, but they don't know how much. What that is formally, in terms of my partial identification work, is an application of the idea of monotone treatment response that I introduced in a 1997 article in Econometrica. And what I do in this paper is I then go through formally the decision theoretic application and first, eliminating dominated search rules. And it turns out that you can actually eliminate some things as dominated. It's, it's actually, even with this weak assumption. That, that was the kind of the result I was most happy with in the paper, is that uh, dominance uh, gets you somewhere. And then I crank out, this is algebra, crank out uh, minimax or minimax regret solutions uh, among the undominated cases. Again, don't have any uh, time to spend more on that. I will just mention uh, briefly that I then did a second application more recently on something that may look very different but turns out to have the same mathematical structure. This is, again, a medical case. It's the problem of uh, choosing a vaccination policy. The, um, uh, there's, a, there's just a kind of a direct analogy. It's like between the investment, the portfolio allocation, and the social planning problem. There's a direct mathematical um, analogy between the search problem uh, and the vaccination problem. Here, the social planner wants to maximize the, uh, well, wants to minimize the rate of illness in a population. There's an infectious disease going around, and you can vaccinate people against the uh, infectious disease. And the, hard, and the question is, what fraction of the population should you vaccinate? That's like the search rate in the uh, crime problem. And um, there's a large public health and epidemiology literature that sets up optimization problems that are just like public economics problems. So I find myself reading um, journals uh, with uh, the name, one journal was called Mathematical Biosciences, another one's called Vaccine, and they're doing normative public economics, setting up optimal vaccination problems. The thing that bothered me is that all those optimization problems assumed that the health agency, let's say the NHS here, knows how the illness rate drops as I increase the vaccination rate. And if you think about it, that's a very, very hard problem because it involves uh, issues of biological transmission of disease, and we may have incomplete knowledge of the biological transmission of disease. And, and what really brought this to my attention since I had done work on social interactions is that transmission of disease is a classic social interaction problem. And in order to understand how uh, illness rates drop as vaccination rates go up, we have to understand the social interaction process. And we don't. So the optimization problems that were set up in the public health literature, I think, you know, were based on assumptions that I found not credible. So I did the same kind of analysis there, and that's all I'll say about that. In the uh, few minutes that I have less left, I'll talk about, we'll move from medical decision making back to the heart of public economics. Um, this is just a, this is a working paper on my webpage on choosing size of government under ambiguity, infrastructure spending, and income taxation. And let me uh, try to take the, uh, a few minutes I have left to, to go through that. The optimal size of government has been a subject of continuing debate. Uh, I was, uh, this is an issue in the UK. Um, I was particularly motivated by the, um, despite the fact that I'm being filmed, I will say the never-ending and totally dysfunctional debates in the United States on a large government versus a small government. Um, 
Part of the problem is that size of government is an imprecise term, but even if you make it precise, uh, then there are uh, sharp disagreements about what size government is optimal. Part of it's from normative uh, differences among people. Uh, but part of it, and this is where the econometrics comes in, is from different beliefs about the outcomes that are yielded by alternative policy choices. That's the part that I wanted to focus on. So we, spe we pose and we analyze social planning problems. And uh, I mentioned Murley's uh, before. Uh, Murley's began one strain of this literature. What Murley's uh, considered, of course, was the use of income taxation to redistribute income given fixed public spending. That was the setup in his paper. And of course, economists have spent a long time deriving optimal tax schedules, assuming knowledge of uh, income leisure preferences. Of course, Richard, sitting here, we've had the recent Murley's re uh, review, and uh, you know it's uh, uh, you know intended to help policy planning here. So I think everyone here is very well familiar with this. There's another literature that began more from the macro rather than the public economics literature, uh, uh, which I think began with Barrow in uh, 1990, which considered the use of public spending to promote growth. And so this uh, literature does not focus on the distributional. Uh, questions that Murley's did, but rather uh, it's kind of representative agent literature, uh, and the issue is uh, the use of public spending to promote growth uh, through uh, public investments, infrastructure, and so on. And that's also an optimization literature that assumes a lot of things. Now, uh, what I did is, is I, uh, as usual, I started to worry about what we actually know. So what I will mention briefly is I, I, I have another paper, which is on my webpage, um, which is really kind of critical background for this, is I did a uh, uh, paper, and this is kind of a formal econometric analysis on um, uh, the effect of uh, income taxes on uh, labor supply, you know, an age-old question, and uh, did my critique of the structural econometrics literature on this topic, and then uh, redid things under weaker assumptions that are usually used. Some of that paper goes back to early Samuelson ideas of revealed preference analysis. Other, others are more uh, modern partial identification analysis. Uh, the only thing I'll, uh, I'll, I'll say is that the conclusion I reach, which is not a surprise if you know what conclusions I usually reach, which is that we don't know as much as we think we know. And uh, on this critical issue, which has been uh, so hot in the United States and, and I think in, uh, in Europe as well, as to what the implications of uh, raising or lowering, in, uh, in particularly high-end income taxes are, you know, marginal rates on the, uh, on the high end, uh, would that, uh, would that um, lead to increased labor supply or decreased labor supply? Uh, there are results all over the place, but I concluded we just don't really know. So how are you going to form policy on gov size of government if you don't know uh, that. Uh, we also don't know, uh, which even, uh, 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 there there's a very large literature on the effect of ta income taxes on labor supply. There's an, uh, another question, this is a basic production function question, is what is, the, uh, what is the productivity of government spending on infrastructure? And I think we know very little about that as well. And that's what I really focus on in this, this new paper, is that we don't know anything much about the effect of government spending on infrastructure. If you don't know that, the effect of uh, I income taxation on labor supply, and if you don't know much about the effect of government spending uh, on infrastructure spending on, um, uh, you know, on private productivity, then how are we going to uh, answer a question like the uh, optimal size of government? So what I do in this paper is I formally lay out choice of size of government as a problem of planning under ambiguity. And um, my focus is on infrastructure spending, similar to that in uh, the growth literature, a la Barrow. Uh, but I formalize the problem in a way that's much closer to Murley's. And, uh, uh, and I run through it, and I crank out in the paper uh, the choice of uh, size of government under various decision criteria. One is if you, max, if, if you put a subjective probability distribution on everything that you don't know, then how would you choose size of government? Uh, how would you do it if you uh, did it from a maximum perspective? How would you do it from a minimax regret perspective? And also from another a criteria for decision under ambiguity called the Hurwitz criteria for Leo Hurwitz, which goes back to 1950s as well. The results is that you can justify you know, in retrospect, not surprisingly, but you've got to crank it out formally, that uh, you, can ju you can rationalize having a smaller or large government. Because we don't really know, even if you know what welfare function you want to optimize, just the lack of knowledge we have about the productivity of government spending and about the tax implications uh, um, 
the labor supply implications of taxation is so limited that one could rationalize a small or a large government. So that's what that paper does. Um, it's kind of a, uh, a negative conclusion about policy making, but I'm sort of used to those. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to be, that anyone's going to be paralyzed. Uh, it just means you have to face up to the fact, and this is what I'm, if I sometimes think, you know, preaching. I'm non-religious, but this sometimes seems to come close to, to preaching, is that in making policy, we need to face up to our lack of knowledge and not hide from it. And um, I, what I think we can do as economists is we can't make the policy decisions, but I think we can help policymakers structure the decisions that they face, uh, help them see what we actually do and don't know from credible research, and uh, make it, you know, in some sense, easier for them to face up to the difficulty of their task uh, by abusing them of the idea that there is one optimal policy. Okay, They've, public policy making is very hard, and we can try to uh, help them uh, structure it. Um, the uh, that's with given data. The um, what I conclude is that, um, uh, that that's given what we now know. What I conclude in this last paper, and the same thing applies for everything that I've talked about, is we want to do better. We want to increase the knowledge that we now have. And so that, of course, calls for further research. Okay, Because we actively do need further research so that we'll know more than we now know. And um, I'll just say one thing as a very last thing to conclude. Um, about the way that we do research. I, uh, some of the thing, one thing that's come to bother me about the way uh, economists operate is uh, the incentives in our profession are for uh, very small research teams, often a single author or two co-authors, usually no more than three people writing together, maybe with a research assistant, um, to, to do a piece of work and to get it published in a journal and then to go on to your next piece of work. Uh, and um, what I think is going to be required uh, to uh, really make progress on uh, inferential, on, on doing empirical research that will allow us to make better public policy is not, may not be produced by that conventional mode of academic research. What may be required instead is a, um, a kind of a big science, long-term uh, view of research, which of course is very common in medicine and is very common in some of the sciences. Um, I particularly think about policy making about climate change policy, where you have large groups uh, working over many years, um, you know, where that works, and somehow in economics that hasn't happened. The, the closest example I can come to this is a, a guy, and it's not just that Richard's sitting there, but even when I'm in the United States, I say that IFS is the closest example that I can come to this of having a, uh, a, you know, a long-term uh, research agenda in, in a larger group, and I just think we need a lot more of that uh, to um, uh, to make progress. So I've carried you a slightly over, but uh, which may leave no time for uh, any questions. But uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, great. Great last statement. I, I didn't say. Um, yeah. Let's all admit the lack of knowledge. I think we do. We do have a bit of time. Uh, we're running into coffee, so. But if there's one or two uh, questions, we've got a, a roving mic here, and it's always nice to hear them. So, is there anyone who would like to raise anything here? There's one at the front. So, uh, I think there's somebody with a, a mic. <laughs> Is that right? Oh, right. Well, then, uh, why don't you just shout your question, and we'll try and... Uh... Just a quick question. I know it's not only literature, but what can you say about ex-post evaluation of policies? So, what do we say about ex-post ex evaluation yeah, of policies? Um, there's no magic in ex-post evaluation. Um, uh, most policies that get contemplated will uh, never get implemented, and so then uh, there can't be any ex post evaluation. Remember, we're always comparing policy options. One will get implemented, others won't. The ones that don't get implemented, you can't do any ex post evaluation. So that's an immediate issue. For the one that does get implemented, you get some data, uh, and that's useful. Uh, 
and you may learn something from it, but of course what actually happens is uh, the result of all that policy and everything else that's changing in the world at the same time. Um, so, uh, although, so the way I, as an econometrician, view ex post uh, evaluation is simply as we get another couple of data points after ex post, you know, more than we had ex ante, and so there's more that we can say than we did uh, uh, beforehand, but uh, I, I think it's uh, uh, very naive to think that uh, one can uh, solve the problems that I've been uh, focusing on purely through ex post evaluation. And I often hear that said, that uh, that's the uh, answer to this, and I, I think it, uh, it only helps a bit, n not that much. Um, okay, the first, that's a very important point. Um, you think I made things tough over the past hour. I made things easy by ignoring the question that you raised. I, I had assumed that we had a well-defined social welfare function, the social planner did. You know, Murley's wrote down a social welfare function, all these other papers did, and, and then I focused on the problem of uh, making decision making with partial knowledge. But then, of course, you know, what is the social welfare function? You could imagine the idea of a planner, so that there is a social welfare function, but the planner is an idealization of a sort of a cohesive democratic society, so somehow we have to measure this implicit social welfare function. Yeah, that adds to the ambiguity. I, I know how to deal with it formally. As you say, there's a further partial identification problem. It adds to the ambiguity, and so I know exactly mathematically how to handle it. I, I've tended in my formal work, um, I, I've tended to maybe have a caveat about that, but not to stress it, because I'm accused already of being nihilistic enough and uh, adding that makes it tougher. But, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. One last one. Okay. In that case, uh, let's thank Chuck again for a wonderful talk.